quiet, numbskulls. I'm broadcasting. Can we get serious now? One thing that did happen during the 60s was some music of an unusual or experimental nature did get recorded and did get released. Now look at who the executives were in those companies at those times. Not hip young guys. These were cigar chomping old guys who looked at the product that came and said, I don't know. Who knows what it is? Record it. Stick it out of it. So, all right. We were better off with those guys than we are now with the supposedly hip young executives who are making the decisions of what people should see and hear in the marketplace. Success in the music business begins with a dream, a vision. This podcast will give you, the listener, the insight and tools to turn that vision into a reality. Meet the industry professionals who work day by day behind the scenes, helping to make those dreams come true. Welcome to the business side of music. Well, once again, it's one of those remote interviews because of, you know, not only the COVID thing, we can only use that excuse so many times, but this gentleman actually happens to be out in Chico, California, uh, my son's old stomping grounds when he went to Chico State. Noah Becker is with us, who is the co-founder and president of AdRev, and he's going to share with us what their company does, because this is a very unique approach to not only content ID, but also the monetization of it also. Noah, welcome to the show. Thank you. Sorry, just a quick correction. I'm sorry if I misspoke before we started. Please. Sorry. I'm from Chico, California. So big shout out to NorCal and all the Chicoans out there. Uh, but I'm currently in Los Angeles, California. Okay, well, we're not going to hold that against you. So yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, AdRev is a, a digital rights management administration strategy company predominantly focused on YouTube strategy and content ID monetization, YouTube channel monetization, channel strategy. But we do provide a lot of SaaS, so software as a service solutions to trade organizations and other larger vendors. Uh, we work with folks from really successful DIY artists like Snow the Product, who's former Atlantic Records and now is doing her own thing, to great success and a variety of other, you know, fantastic independent artists, all the way up to massive enterprise clients like Universal Pictures, Film Music Division, Universal Production Music is a longtime client, BMG Production Music, Warner Chapel Production Music, Extreme Music, all the, not all, but most of the very large TV and film sync libraries, um, because we have a very in-depth expertise in administering sync licenses on YouTube itself beyond this, the kind of standard content ID money. I know that's a lot. So if you have any questions about what any of that meant, then by all means, <laughs> let me know. That was, to me, was just a lot of alphabet soup. So let's start back in the beginning. AdRev was started by you and another gentleman that we briefly touched on before the show started. How did it come about? Yeah, so a good buddy of mine, Ryan Bourne, a friend of mine from Emory University, started an online music licensing library called audiomicro.com, which still exists today. Uh, AdRev still owns and operates it. One of Ryan's great visions was to always prep this platform, Audio Micro, to be really ready to help YouTube creators get access to great music at reasonable prices. In the end, what ended up happening was that Ryan had a, a great meeting with YouTube and tried to sell this, you know, concept of let's sell music, you know, through your platform to your end users. And they said, you know, the product wise, they weren't quite there or interested in that, but uh, asked if we were having copyright infringement issues or felt that YouTube might be a place where people were using that audio micro music without the requisite license to actually have it in their videos, to which he responded, absolutely. So we were able to get contracts directly with Google, YouTube, to begin administering what is called the YouTube content ID system. And that is what spawned AdRev, and that was in 2011. And so AdRev is really a spinoff of what was originally an online music licensing platform. And as I mentioned prior, we have all these very large clients in the TV and film music licensing space. Because of our experience with Audio Micro, we also have a great deal of experience with actually administering sync licenses. Now, I'm guessing you know what a sync license is, but perhaps for the listeners, just in case a sync license is, 
the license you procure so that you can quote unquote synchronize a third party's music inside your audiovisual content. That could be anything from a YouTube video to a, a television show to a game to a motion picture, anything where audio and visual connect with one another. Absolutely. And it is a massively critical component to any recording artist or songwriter composers economic success in this day and age where, you know, micro pennies per stream, a single sink could provide income and food on the table for a year. It's a very valuable space to know and understand. So for all the artists listening, um, if you don't understand or don't know about synchronization licensing yet, I strongly encourage you to to buff up some knowledge and get involved in this thing. There's a lot of good money to be had. It really does come down to pennies these days or tenths of pennies in the streaming world that we're in. And you mentioned YouTube. When we talk about that platform in itself, standing alone from anything else, was it really ungoverned or unregulated for a, a long period of time before someone such as AdRev came in and started showing a way to, to control this dynamic? And I do want to talk about content ID, the monetization of it. Was that just kind of the wild, wild west for a while? Well, so, I mean, you mentioned governed, you know, so technically all things online are governed by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act as relate to copyright online. But that act, I'm guessing you're aware, Bob, was written in 1998 and things have changed a great deal since 1998. So, so, te so technically, no, it's not the Wild West because there's quote unquote legislation about it. But yeah, it's a it was absolutely the Wild West. I mean, online piracy in general is still absolutely the Wild West. But I really commend YouTube for doing a reasonably good job here of, of figuring out a way and creating a platform whereby you can actually do a, a fair bit of copyright protection with great efficacy or take those infringements and turn them into income if you'd like to. But yeah, it's under, you know, basically the legislation is under, like I said, DMCA, it's section 115. Uh, there's a great deal of language around there around this stuff, but basically it puts the onus of copyright protection and doing takedown notice and takedown work on the copyright owner, which is quite absurd in this day and age when we have platforms like Facebook, Google, and Amazon printing $192,000 in net income per minute. Wow. That we as creators still have to find our own works and issue takedowns. So again, I think YouTube's first mover by necessity. The real backstory is that there was a Viacom suit soon after Google's acquisition of YouTube. I don't know the exact timeline, but within like years. And that was for mass scale allowance of infringement, you know, technically speaking. YouTube was protected uh, and indemnified by, by the DMCA, and they still are to this day, as is Facebook and Twitch and everybody else. But Viacom, as you well know, has got a pretty penny to spend in a courtroom. Yeah. So the outcome of the suit essentially was a settlement, and it's a closed-door settlement, but my understanding is basically the output was, it was YouTube Content ID came to, came to being. And the Viacom was possibly, I, I cannot qualify the statement, but possibly the absolute first adopter of the YouTube content ID system by, by way of them, you know, be poking the bear and getting that suit settled up with this system. We came along, AdRev came along, as I mentioned, I believe in 2011. Prior to us being there, there were other YouTube content ID specific aggregators, and that's a, that's a big word soup, but people who help other people with YouTube content ID. We take in lots of third party rights and we administer those on behalf of those third parties. So there were other players in the space already that are still in the space today, but we were, we were quite early. We were first three or four dedicated administrators of this system, really learned a lot and up ramped a knowledge base and an experience base that just kind of still to this date has us pretty far out ahead of the pack in terms of understanding technology and, and the tech enabled services that we kind of package around what we do. It's no longer the Wild West per se on YouTube. YouTube's also done a great job of cleaning up the system over the past couple of years. And really my only remaining gripe 
for them would be, you know, how do we get independent musicians who maybe don't want to work through an aggregator or only want to do takedown work because they're still selling enough vinyl to support their careers off of Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. There are still many millions of those types of creators out there who, who can create income streams of their own. They have, you know, as they always say, it only takes a thousand rabid fans you know, to uh, sell enough merch and vinyls and other spe specialty items to those fans to kind of plot along in a music career. So um, we'd like to find more ways in. I, I work in Washington uh, with Creative Future, the NMPA, Copyright Alliance, and, and other trade orgs, the RIAA, to try and help their cause to get more independent creator access to, to these critical tools like YouTube Content ID. Let's talk about that process of, of you working sure. with entities in Washington, D.C. Education for content creators when it comes to content ID, that to me would seem like it'd be just an ongoing pursuit. And it's, that'd be 100 percent time in a job, you know, just you'd spend you'd spend nothing else but working yeah. on that, trying to educate the content cr creators, because, you know, let's face it, we have a different generation of creative people out there than we did 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with a lot different platforms, you know, with streaming than we were with physical product, although, as you said, vinyl is starting to make a good, strong comeback educating these these content creators about content id how does that go about how do you convince them this is actually a good beneficial thing for them well you know i'll say that the creators who have i'll just say music assets that i refer to as velocity so when i say high velocity it just means uh, an asset that's traveling around the interwebs pretty fast and it's pretty popular right. so artists composers that own their own stuff you know that have high velocity assets you won't need to do much convincing after a month or two they're going to start to see the data and money trickle in and realize they should have been done doing this for a long time before for folks where the money is not going to be terribly material there may not be a compelling argument aside from the fact that get the data and run with mm -hmm. it if data is king which it is there's a lot that you can do to leverage data. So even let's say you, you're you not terribly popular as an artist, but let's say you put your files in through AdRev or quite candidly, we have some gates up around who we, we generally want to work with, but we do have trusted competitors that will refer earlier phase artists to and things like that. People we know and trust to do good work for, for those artists if they don't fit sort of our portfolio of client type. And the data is king. So if you even if you're not too popular, you deliver a few tracks, maybe you had a big hit on Spotify five years ago and you got an EP coming out, but you never really capitalized on all that heat you know, around that one single, you had a meme moment happen. Who knows? Mm -hmm. You know, all this, there's a lot of this kind of one hit and then fizzle stuff happening. But if that hit is still out there and a million people put it in their YouTube videos, well, then that alone, you know, might be a million views a day. And that could equate to a couple hundred bucks a day in monetization income. It will equate to a lot of data about the type of folks that are using your music in their videos. You might find a big brand needle dropped your music in their video and you wrote that song and you produced it yourself you're a hundred percent recording owner a hundred percent publishing owner you find a big brand with their hands in the cookie jar on youtube that could be a ten thousand dollar settlement no problem there's just a lot of actionable intelligence that you can get out of the data aside from the money now that said if you never put a record out and you have zero monthly listeners on spotify none of that's really going to be applicable to you but if you've had any velocity whatsoever if you've had music travel at all if you've been putting your tracks up on pond five and you've transacted hundreds of licenses over the years this is activity that is absolutely critical for you to if you're actually trying to have a sustainable career in composition or recording arts so you cannot have value to your copyright if you do not assign value to it so if you're letting it travel and be synced for free then you're you're willingly negating value of your own hard work. That doesn't make any sense, does no, it? No, absolutely not. On the show with us today, Noah Becker, who is the president and co-founder of AdRev. This is Chris Bragg with Ghostwriter Music. Make sure to check out our episode on the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. 
When you have a Korg synth at your fingertips, the possibilities are endless. Be it digital, analog, analog modeling, altered FM, wave sequencing, or the multi-engine synth, Korg gives you easy access to a variety of features to help you get the perfect sounds quickly. Whether you're a professional musician or just starting out, Korg truly has a synthesizer to help you express yourself. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products to create new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. Hi everyone, I'm Larry Butler, and I want to send you a free digital copy of my new book, The Singer-Songwriter Rulebook, 101 Ways to Help You Improve Your Chances of Success. That's right, everything you need to know to launch your career as a singer-songwriter, all based on my 40 years in the live performance arena, and believe me, I've seen it all. In my book, you'll find the 10 things you have to deal with before even thinking about becoming a singer-songwriter performer. You'll also learn about the five things every singer-songwriter can do this weekend to make their live show better. Five things I can guarantee that you are not doing already. Plus, there's tips on songwriting and staging, photo and video shoots, publishing, merch, dozens of other topics. All written for people who don't particularly like to read. And again, it's free. Just go to the Business Side of Music website homepage and look for my book cover. Click on it and a free digital copy of my book will be yours. I'm Larry Butler and I approve of this message. You're listening to the Business Side of Music. Back in the studio, Noah Becker, who is from Los Angeles, California today. <laughs> Sorry, Chico State fans. Uh, the guy has moved to L.A. Uh, Noah Becker is with us here from AdRev. The company is celebrating its 10-year anniversary. You've got, what, now 100 million subscribers in your network and yeah. $250 million paid in revenue to the rights owners. I mean, those are some pretty big feathers in your cap. Thank you. That didn't come overnight, obviously. Uh, that that no. took some time to get there. <laughs> and once again, kind of jumping back to the content ID, when you don't have your music protected any way, every way, and in all ways, you are really, in a literal sense, you're dropping the ball from a monetary standpoint you did mention that you have a certain clientele that you look at what are those parameters to fall within the ad rev family well i think one that it's that it is a, i'll say that it's an elastic and dynamic range because we do we do operate occasionally as all humans do on feeling i like that elastic and dynamic range i, I haven't heard yeah. that one before yeah. if we feel good about something we may make exception to some of our floors for subscriber count or asset counts and things like this. We are engaging in in a just a very dipping of toes in the water in some early phase artist development, testing some of our strategic theories on YouTube. But generally speaking, on the channel side, we want to see somebody in the 100,000 plus subscriber range at least because the, that's a basis that we can really help a push happen. We are an at scale provider What that just to kind of translate that to a listener who might not kind of know what exactly I mean by that is that the business AdRev and businesses like AdRev do better at scale. So because we can manage one client with 100,000 rights, maybe with four, four headcount, and then we can add another client with another 500,000 rights, and we might only need to add half a headcount. Okay. But when we take on tons of clients that don't have a lot of rights, and there's not a lot of monetization involved in those rights, obviously, those become loss propositions for us. I'm just speaking general business terms for people to understand. We, we would take everybody in the world if we could. Absolutely. You know, I'm an artist. I want all artists to be able to have a chance to succeed. But in the end, you know, we got a bottom line to protect. So, you know, 100,000 and up is sort of floor, I think, on a channel. That said, you know, if a brand or, you know, an artist has investors and those investors want to hire us to consult and put some money in our pockets to do the work, you know, again, I'm not trying to oversell, undersell anything, just kind of stating the case of how we operate. On the independent artist side and on the, you know, sort of more high volume rights owner administrator side, 
that really is when the dynamic range kind of starts to come into play a little bit more in terms of like if we're not going to be administering a channel and it's only content ID work that they want us to do. We have some methodology and some ways that we can kind of stress test the value proposition of any given client using some of our own internal tech um, and making decisions there. But for earlier phase artists that just need content ID, we should have a long tail solution again, a, a more is kind of feed it yourself, do it yourself solution rolled back out at scale by, you know, mid 2022, something like that. This is pretty standard business maturity stuff. What what happens when you start a business, you'll take anything and everything that walks in the door because you just you got to grow, grow, grow. You got to get it off the ground and you got to you got to plant your flag and let people know you're out there. And then eventually you get to profitability and you start to have to be a little bit more judicious about the you know the client profiles that you want to bring on and how you may have to scale you know your operations to to be able to to properly support those clients so that's all to say the last thing we want to do is bring on a client that we're going to you know not be able to provide the support that they expect from us so that's again very dynamic and elastic but you got a channel 100,000 subscribers or more that you're actively uploading to um, and it's a newer channel, you know, that, that you need help with. That's something we, we'd love to have a chat. I think that there's that it's worth taking a look. And even for those, just to throw it out there, you know, for those channels that aren't at that range, but if you're growing, just the channel growth comes and starts to get organic. Really, once you get in that two, 3,000 subscriber range, if you keep posting content, it's going to keep growing. So I just want to encourage you out there. If you've got a channel and you got a few hundred or a thousand subscribers, that's fantastic. And just keep working it. It's going to, all it requires is that stick to itiveness. Now, is this for music based content only, or could it be spoken word? Is there any limitations to that at all? Plenty of limitations, but it's definitely not for music content only. We definitely administer plenty of audio visual rights. So we have a wonderful longtime client uh, out of Brooklyn called Film Rise. Film Rise is an administrator and owner of different episodic content. They have a pretty long license, I believe, on forensic files. So if you go on Amazon and watch forensic files, you see Film Rise logo flash. Danny Fisher's brilliant entre entrepreneur in that space, a longtime client and, and friend and mentor. So we got them and uh, some trauma films through them and, and uh, vision films, Lise Romanov and, and some other really cool folks in the independent film space. So no, it's not just music, but spoken words and no go. There there are certain things that are just sort of categorically not allowed by YouTube mm -hmm. into the system. Those are items predominantly that will trip up a, a fingerprint system. There's not enough harmonic content or structure to those sounds or visuals for them to create high confidence matches. So for example, if you and I go both sit at a, a Steinway Grand and, and play first inversion C major as a riser and then reverse it, right? And then try and put that into content ID. Well, there's 7 million other composers that have made the same riser in their studio. And, and it's just going to be a big mess of bad matches and things like this. So right. it's generally got to be original music, original film or audio, spoken words, a no go. I think there are methods by which you can work with your YouTube partner manager to maybe have occasionally, you know, some borderline content if you set it up properly and that thing is coming in from a really massive provider. Typically, I don't think they want uh, like a podcast, you know, fingerprinted, but there are ways that you could fingerprint a podcast and not have it auto trigger everything that it could tell you what's out there before you made a confirmation on that result. I'm actually not the best person to ask about this anymore because I'm removed. I'm a bit removed from operational capacities at this point. There's very standard links you can go find, like you could go Google search what's allowed in Content ID YouTube, and it'll give you the, the laundry list, you know, no uncleared samples, blah, 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 all the, all the stuff that you, you would assume. When we talk about Content ID, is this like the equivalent of a ISRC code, 
or is it something that is a standalone just for YouTube? And then I guess the second part to that question is, is it something that would be considered a floating ID so it wouldn't necessarily always be in the same segment, a section of a particular body of work? Or does it float around from song to song or is it a static content ID that stays there so it's easier for platforms like YouTube to recognize? Does that make sense? I think so, and I'll do my best to answer. You could just cut me off if I'm running my mouth, which I know I tend to do plenty. So, But no, Content ID is a registered trademark of YouTube Google, the actual term capital C content, capital ID, YouTube content ID. So that's actually the YouTube technology. What that technology is is an audio fingerprint technology. So ISRCs have... The only application they have to the fingerprint is that they're in a metadata container that's associated with a fingerprint. But that fingerprint requires no metadata to be functionally operational, right? So basically what an audio fingerprint is, there's a few different ways. And please excuse me, I am not an engineer. I'm a, I'm a product guy. So I'll do my best to to describe it in, in lay person terms of it. It's basically, there's a few ways to do it. There's hash summing and there's heat mapping. Uh, there may be other ways beyond my capacity for understanding. Heat mapping would be to take harmonic content, so the chordal structure, when the chords are moving and at what tempo, what inversions. Not that the audio fingerprint would understand these inversions. It's literally just translating them into graphical information. Then doing the same thing with beat and tempo, hi-hats, kick drums, kind of seeing where the peaks and valleys are. Anybody who's ever used After Effects, you know, you can key turn the audio into keyframe. So it's like keyframing almost different points of the audio, but then placing those, I believe, on like a three axis, like an XYZ graph. So it's got like harmonic structure, heat map, top line structure, heat map, like what's the vocal doing or the top line melody, you know, things like this. And that sort of like a rhythm map. Again, this I may be way off, but this is my basic understanding of the heat map. Mm -hmm. All those layers combine to become a, a piece of actual scientific information, right? That when video is uploaded to YouTube and it contains audio, every single piece of video uploaded to YouTube will get pushed against that database of fingerprints. Now, that same thing that I just described also exists for audio visual, for, for video. And on the video side, they're doing, they're adding like an RGB heat map. So where are the red, green, blue balances throughout the screen over time? Now, hash summings is a completely different take, which is that you're going to take tiny little slices of audio and that, that you have some algorithmic proprietary algorithm that takes the audio and spits it out into letters and numbers. So audio sounds like this and it gets an eight, four, six, hash, hash, dash, dash, dollar sign, wh whatever. Like mm -hmm. it's a hash sum. It's a long string of characters. And you maybe take a quarter second splice of audio and create from that, a, you know, maybe it's a 256 character hash. So that over a few minutes of audio, maybe you have a couple million pieces of syntax worth of hash, but that's still just like, like a couple kilobyte file to store. So the, re representing it in text is a way to have cheap storage of the fingerprint, essentially. But the same story there, that's not, I believe YouTube's is a heat map. Um, there are third parties that are more on the hash sum. And then symbols, our technology, I believe, is a, a sort of alchemy between the two. But yeah, basically, you're representing audio in some sort of scientific format, right? And that is what is going to get compared to the content that gets uploaded to platform and then when that audio finds matching heat maps or hash sums inside the audio of the video that got uploaded, it creates the match. Boom, boom, boom. Now, all of that that I described literally just happens in milliseconds as you're uploading a video to YouTube. So these fingerprints have to be light. They have to be able to travel fast and they have to be able to get pushed against lots of different indexes all at the same time. So that is to say the content ID fingerprints, the YouTube ones, they're static. They're inside YouTube. They're not, you're not getting help from YouTube's content ID system if you want to go scan Facebook, for example, or if you wanted to go scan Vimeo. For that, you could lean into, you know, our proprietary technology symbols, which is, stands for similarities between audio signals. That's a proprietary fingerprint. 
So similar to the YouTube content ID system, but we, AdRev, own and operate it. There are other providers, a great provider out of Spain called BMAT. I know the founders there. There's a big tech company out of the U.S. called PEX. They also have a proprietary fingerprint. There's TuneSat, one of the earliest players in the space. Audible Magic, Vance, the CEO and founder over there is lovely. There's a lot of great players in this space. There's a lot of good solutions out there. So sorry, I know you didn't ask, but just to tie it back to the DC stuff that I do, it's uh, I just got to say it's really not cool that uh, the Facebooks, the Twitches, and the other platforms out there can't just like adopt some technical measures to help those independent creators do protection because there's a laundry list of really capable vendors like myself, like the ones I just mentioned, that just want to help. And as long as we can get on reasonable financial terms with the platforms, we could sort of make all their problems go away with copyright. But they would prefer to sit around and hide behind DMCA. It's pretty pathetic. But hopefully they'll come around eventually. And, and we're doing some great work with some of the trade orgs to force them to come around. That was a really long answer. It's a, but that is, it's a, I want to say, though, really quick, Bob, because I do remember another thing about things traveling around. I think what you're referring to more on a mark that travels, that would be more like you would watermark a piece of audio. Mm -hmm. So watermarking is when you, you know, tag audio, tag a file with some like really high frequency noise or something that a human can't actually hear, but a computer could hear. And then when that water, so like maybe you download a file from some, does anybody download from stores anymore? But it, let's say you did at that store, let's say you ran your own label store, you know, and charge $3 to download the EP or something. You could add a watermark on those downloads that's unique to that downloader. And then if they take that file and then used it in a YouTube video, you might get the content ID match. Outside of content ID, you could take that match and push it back against your, your fingerprint database, which would know what watermark was contained in that use. Does that make sense? It does. Absolutely. Okay. So I think that answers your other question because you're asking about can something float around and travel? Floating around and traveling is a combination of watermarking on download and then fingerprinting on, on match source to see who did the thing with the thing. On the show with us, Noah Becker, president and co-founder of AdRev. You're listening to the business side of music. What does it take to succeed in country music? Hi, this is Candy O'Terry, your host for Country Music Success Stories. And this is JC Don Valeris, your Music City mentor. Our Nashville based podcast takes you into the homes and onto the back porches of country music icons. And the stories they tell us just might inspire you to make your country music success story come true. Check out Country Music Success Stories on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe today. Since 1963, Korg has been creating new experiences in music and performance. That is what drove the creation of some of Korg's most legendary products, such as the Poly 6, the M1, the Electribe, the Triton, the Minilog, the Kronos, Wavestate, Op6, and most recently, the Nautilus, which is what we have here in our studio. Korg is dedicated to creating new, innovative, and uncompromising instruments which maintain the highest quality to inspire music makers, past, present, and future. Visit Korg.com or your favorite Korg dealer to get your hands on one of their products and start creating new music always. Korg, the official sponsor of the business side of music. You're listening to the business side of music. Back on the show, Noah Becker is with us today. How can people find your company, AdRev? What's the best way to find? Is it is it on YouTube sure. or is it a website? We're on the interwebs at adrev.net, N-E-T. And you can hit the contact us button there. Yeah, we have a slick little radio drop down. You can just select sort of what type of client profile you have and drop us a note. And we'll generally get back to every single person that emails us. Even the clear, you know, we get occasionally some some fraudulent stuff coming in that we have to, you know, steer away from. But we'll, we'll get back. Hey, sorry, we can't work with you. You know, so you will hear back from us in due course. But honesty and transparency about 
your portfolio of rights would be greatly appreciated. So we can know how to redirect your query. You know, if you're not yet a, a million sales superstar artist, you know, please don't tell us that you are. But yeah, we're, we're very gracious. The team is, is exceptional at, at, at responsiveness. And just like I said, most of us, at least I said myself, but most of us at Adrev are actually artists as well. We have uh, many thespians, screenwriters, instrumentalists, producers, composers, DJs, you name it, a bunch of really talented, brilliant folks, you know, work for us also as technologists. So we, we want to support artistry and we'll be happy to hear from you. And if you're not a right fit for us, we will point you in a direction of, of, uh, of administrator that we, we know and trust to do good work. Noah, thank you so much for being on the show. Been my pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me. The business side of music is the creation of Tom Sabella and Tracy Snow and is produced by Bob Bender. The business side of music is recorded at Music Dog Studios in Nashville, Tennessee. Production sound design by Keith Stark. Voiceover and promo by Lisa Fusine. Never had one lesson. This tape will self-destruct in five seconds. You're still here? It's over. Go home. Go.